now works at uh, the um, and work, the, the all experiments work here uh, this region basically so it's just uh, some proposed energy scan uh, ongoing energy scan and also here are uh, LHC experiments so basically one can one can see that uh, the all uh, collisions of heavy ions that first of all collide then create uh, this plasma fireball then uh, expand and hadronize the all story approximately happens here at a relatively low baryonic chemical potential that's why i will exclude uh, chemical potential at all from my considerations so basically we'll be working here at this particular line and uh, the vacuum here of course at uh, zero mev uh, temperature and phase transition approximately happens at qcd at 150 mev and it's actually not a transition it's kind of very smooth crossover so when you don't have thermodynamic singularity, but on top of that, I will add the rotation. Why add the rotation? Because here we see that if ions, they collide uh, non-centrally, then there will be some uh, angular momentum which will uh, leave in the system just mechanically because we collide ions and they will create plasma, which is already in rotation. So that's an idea. And if you just consider non-rotating plasma, what we know from the lattice and also what we kind of established uh, very well, that the phase diagram is basically the line if you don't have any rotation. So and we have here a smooth crossover from hadronic phase to quark gluon plasma phase, which is accompanied by two uh, phase transitions or basically transitions, smooth transitions. One of them is the restoration of chiral symmetry. Another one is the confining transition. They are approximately at the same temperature. So difference between them is 10%. So it uh, depends on definition, how we define it. Uh, if you, for example, decide to define the confining temperature, say, in terms of uh, the entropy of uh, of the quarks, heavy quarks, then you will get approximately the same temperature as this one. So because since we have not, don't have any thermodynamic singularity, then the temperature is um, approximately the same. I mean, it's, it's vaguely defined, but okay, it's 150 MeV approximately. So here was uh, quark gluon, uh, sorry, this is uh, the uh, chiral condensate, which uh, dis almost disappears uh, as we go move through the temperature. And here is the normalized polycovulp, which corresponds to, which actually calculates, uh, gives us uh, the knowledge about free energy of a free quark. So if it's non-zero, uh, so we have the confining phase, then the polycovulp as uh, order parameter must be non-zero. So that's what we know. From here, it's very well established and we know this. Okay, now let's make pl plasma rotating. The question is, why do we need this? Uh, just because, as I said, uh, we have non-central heavy ion collisions, and when two ions collide, uh, they form the plasma, uh, which rotates. So first of all, the effects which we will have here, since the plasma is created by uh, the particles which have the uh, uh, charged, <clears throat> They are already charged, so they're positively charged ions. That's why it will be charged. And since this plasma will be rotating, it gets some angular momentum, then we will get uh, some magnetic field here, which will be directed out of plane direction. However, this magnetic field decays quite quickly and we will not touch it here. At least people claim that there will be some effects on the rotation, uh, maybe, but we will not touch it here because we'll concentrate only on one particular point and concentrate on effect of mechanical rotation itself. And uh, rotation, of course, will be here because, again, if you look to this uh, to this graph, you will see that uh, some ions, of course, will miss. Uh, okay, so sorry, some some partons will miss the uh, mm, the target, but some of them will create this quark plasma phase. And actually, the classically, the uh, rotational momentum will be quite large, which 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 contains the system. And the moment which is transferred to the plasma will be also quite large. It's from thousand to ten thousand h bar. So it's quite large momentum. So we can really speak about rotating, uh, collectively rotating plasma here. And uh, yeah, and times of flight, uh, just this is uh, old paper uh, from uh, physics reports. It's approximately, time is very short. It's, you see, it's just a Fermi, basically three Fermi divided by speed of flight. But still it's enough to <laughs> understand what's going on with the plasma. And uh, the... Uh, rotation uh, has been observed uh, about five years ago published by in, in Nature. Uh, so it was observed in the rig. At LHC, it's impossible because actually the energy of collision is too high. At RIC, it's quite lower. That's why it's uh, we can actually create something and see how it rotates. It's a little bit contradictory, but uh, RIC is more suitable than LHC. And uh, the rotation here is approximately, um, just an angular frequency is approximately 10 to the power 22 um, hertz. So it's quite high. However, still, uh, despite the system is ultra relativistic because we can neglect all masses of quarks everywhere, this rotation actually is not so strong. 
it's not so i would say it's not so rapid we can even think about some non-relativistic rotation in the relativistic system because the typical energy here omega okay um, not energy but um, the uh, rotational frequency is approximately 6 mev okay you can say 10 approximately mev while the critical temperature of the confined transition is said 150 so we see that the energy of rotation basically is lower than uh, thermal energy per quantum so it's uh, so rotation doesn't add too much so it can be considered like okay it's, it's not, not 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 big addition on the other hand if you consider the size of the system at the thermalization sign uh, time when plasma starts to cool down and create hadrons it's approximately okay it depends on the energy of course but say three fermi over over over, over speed of light oh sorry here this should be this dynamical top so i can correct it anyway so this should be a uh, speed of light so three fermi by speed of light that's if you calculate with this number, you will get that omega times r. So this is velocity of the plasma at the h should be approximately 10% of speed of light. So it's relativistic, but not actually ultra relativistic. I would say that it's not relativistic to me because we can expand all the small parameters at certain quantities. So, okay, that's 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 order of units which we with which we use which we work together. And then okay, and then people discussed a lot. This is just. Uh, actually it's two years or two years ago this big list uh, there are many people who contributed to the uh, to the area and theoretically the description of the plasmas if you would like to calculate something either on the lattice or for example analytically or uh, kind of numerically in different way normally people consider uniform rotation uh, because it's simpler it's like with magnetic fields people consider normally uniform fields is first uh, order approximation then we assume that you work in thermal equilibrium so we, don't, we neglect all expansion. We assume that everything is static. We take cylindrical geometry, which is approximately approximate to this almond shape, but it's not, of course, almond shape. But anyway, this is kind of simple steps where we can start to agree with each other whether we understand or not understand what's going on. And of course, we don't know the QCD at all. I mean, we, okay, we know it, but we don't know it's from ab initio, from first principles, and we use some effective infrared models which describe the dynamics of the system at large distances. So there are normally four simplifications which people use, and with those simplifications, I will work further. Then I would like just to demonstrate how normally it works, just kind of flash a few transparencies one by one, how we can treat the system. So first of all, we have to put system in the cylinder and make it rotating with some global frequency or so like a solid body. So every point has the same angular velocity with respect to the axis of the cylinder. And then we have, of course, to uh, respect the causality. So the velocity of uh, this edge of the cylinder should not exceed speed of light. Otherwise, you'll get a problem. Because the world also works that so people consider, let's say, very slow rotation, but it unbounded system, and they got some very particular effects which couldn't exist, some instabilities and so on. That's just because the photon can travel far away to the end of universe, edge of universe, get uh, some factor, uh, imaginary factor, and come back to the center. So the are closed loops even without interactions where you can get uh, naively very bad effects so that's why uh, system must be bounded and we must put some boundary conditions or at least you must bound it so you know, rotate it with not a big speed not not too large speed so it's important one thing then we say okay what's rotation we just uh, introduce coordinates uh, time uh, radial coordinates height coordinates here and angular coordinates and rotation actually is very simple it's just saying that okay so we have some local coordinate that we should it to laboratory coordinate with some uh, constant shift, yeah. So just in time, two, two pi, uh, two pi um, yeah, periodic. That's all. That's that's how rotation is filled. Then we apply that. We uh, put boundary conditions here. Here is a mighty boundary condition, which typically says that here that uh, we have uh, no current, uh, no physical current, because current goes outside of the boundary of the cylinder. And uh, then, okay, so we bound the system inside this rotating part. So just basically saying that uh, current vanishes in the boundary. And that's how we just do next step. And then finally, uh, all physics in the rotating system is defined in co-rotating frame. That's important because if, you, if I ask about temperature or chemical potential, I measure them in co-rotating frame, not in laboratory, but in co-rotating frame. And uh, then I have to move to co-rotating frame to describe the rotation. In certain sense, it's similar to Rindler coordinates when we discuss systems which are uniformly accelerating. So the system there is flat, so coordinates are flat, in the sense that they are flat physically, so all uh, components of Riemann tensors are the same. 
but the coordinates are still curved. So light will feel some curve due to just because uh, we will have the in this coordinate system will have uh, tensor of uh, matter tensor will have some non-trivial components, especially those which connect space and time. So of diagonal components which will be non-zero. So, so we come to that component and we write a metric element in this particular frame. And then we can start to work with thermodynamics then. So, okay, again, this is what I said already. So all physical comp all, all components of Riemann tensor are of course zero because it's just change of coordinates, but still space is curved because uh, we call it curved because I mean, we have this uh, non-trivial coordinates here in that sense. Okay, then we write Dirac equation curved space time. I talk right now about Dirac and uh, okay, just it's like normal. We have here a spin connection. Uh, we have can define Christoffel symbols uh, in terms of Urbane. So it's just standard technique. So we write uh, the uh, Dirac equation for uh, the system and then everything is free. Everything is free. We define Verbane in terms of it's like square root of metric. There is some freedom to define it, but one can choose, choose suitable coordinates for rotation here. Find some non-zero component of Christopher symbol, give, identify gamma matrices in this plane. I'm fletching transparencies by by just showing that it's kind of well-defined, good uh, procedure, and then we will come to some puzzles. And then we come to core rotating frame, and we see that actually equation gets extremely nice form. So it's again becoming like flat equation where uh, this, those, core, those gamma, gamma matrices are defined in the core rotating frame right now, with only one addition that we get a shift of Hamiltonian. So basically the stem derivative gets accompanied by the part which corresponds to the um, uh, angular momentum of the system, actually projection of angular momentum of total system which contains the uh, orbital part and spin part and multiplied by omega, which plays kind of chemical potential role of kind of chemical potential for rotation. That's all, it's just shift of Hamiltonian. So everything is uh, kind of fine, uh, like under, un, 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 under, under textbook. And then we can just take this, uh, those, uh, this equation, find the wave function solutions, which are characterized by, uh, like usually, like we can distinguish particle antiparticle, angular momentum, radial excitation number, and uh, momentum along axis Z, which is not uh, constrained in that case. An important point that we have to introduce boundaries. So boundaries are very much important. And since we introduce boundaries, we can identify energy in corrotating frame which again is just energy normal frame, a laboratory frame, so it's a uh, inertial frame, minus this part, which corresponds to uh, omega, angular, angular frequency, uh, times uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, our, the parts, uh, this kind of orbital momentum part, which is the orbital, okay, total momentum part, which corresponds orbital momentum part and angular momentum part and also spin angular momentum part. That's all. So we can identify all roots, and those roots will depend on radial part, which de de determined by this complicated equation, which involves some Bessel functions. Just technicality, but I would like to come just to, to the essence. So, okay, so that's we are perfectly can identify what are free fermions in the uh, rotating frame. And the still Maxim, and, and, and what is the mean value of the uh, angular momentum in this situation? Mean, mean value, okay, one can calculate it, of course, because uh, one should then take thermodynamic ensemble, construct it, and then just take a uh, expectation value of that, of that thing, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and what is, what is the, how it depends on, on the mass and radius and... Uh, ah, yeah, but that can be done. In fact, I, I have not this in this talk, we did it, uh, yes, it, there is some dependence, we can do that. I will talk about angular momentum, but for for uh, gluons, uh -huh, okay. uh, one can define everything can be defined, uh, or more one can introduce also magnetic field here. There are many interesting effects here. Yes, that's that's definable, very well detached. Okay, very well cal calculable, no problem at all. So just, but I have not prepared in this talk particular because it will otherwise we will we will come to tomorrow to, to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> so just just to say that things are very well defined, so you can really make step by step. The only problem that here, as I said, that no problem, but kind of important point that one shouldn't consider infinite space because people discuss, for example, people discuss chiral vertical effect in infinite space first. That's Fortunately, it works uh, just because, uh, okay, it, it appears to be working. There are some neutron trivialities there, but in reality, if you calculate some other quantities, you can get easily for rotation, you can get easily, for example, for some physical quantities, some imaginary values uh, similar to this chiral vertical current. So it's one should really bound system and then consider a very smooth limit. So, you know, like you put first okay, omega to zero and then size to infinity, but not vice versa. So that's very much important. So that's that's kind of very well. I would like to say that everything here is under control. Yeah. Then one can calculate energy spectrum. I'm flashing transparency just to say that I'm kind of 
I can, we can do that. So it's, it's just, uh, this is energy in a rotating chemical, uh, sorry, in a rotating, uh, rotating frame. This is the angular momentum in the, uh, this angular moment, which is quantized, half quantized. And here we have different uh, velocities. You see different uh, angular velocities here as a function of radius. And one can see that, for example, if, uh, Omega times R is zero, so it means that basically your uh, you have uh, no rotation. Then spectrum is symmetric under, sorry, symmetric under the um, angular momentum. That that's understandable. That should be because left uh, clockwise and counterclockwise rotations are the same. Once you start to rotate it, then the system starts a little bit to turn. For example, at the omega R equal to half, you see it become kind of asymmetric here. Once you put to the situation where actually your spectrum is uh, close, your rotation close to or equal to the superluminal rotation, so then velocity of boundary is equal to, equals to velocity at the boundary, velocity of light, then you see the spectrum becomes quite interesting. So here there is some dependence at small at, at negative uh, angular momenta, but here it becomes just flat. Spectrum becomes just basically flat at large distance, it will just basically become flat. So if you increase omega uh, times r bigger than one, so you evaluate causality, then your spectrum gets unbounded. It will go down and it will lead you, for example, for bosons, it will lead you to negative occupation numbers, so it's, which are unphysical. The spectrum will be unbounded, thermodynamics cannot be defined, and everything will crash. So that's why it's important to keep this uh, this particular uh, volume, this particular boundary condition uh, um, checked and I mean imposed. Okay, so and then we come to physics. Uh, then uh, one thing which I would like to say that many people, especially in condensed matter, say that okay, rotation is similar to magnetic field. In fact, yes, in some approximations you can say that, but it's not the case. So in, in reality, if you consider relativistic rotation, it's not the same. So. It's, it's clearly can be seen just for very simple reasons. It's just a magnetic field leads to lowest Landau level degeneracy, uh, where while rotation doesn't lead to that. So we don't have any degeneracy due to rotation. And uh, magnetic field is known to have uh, a top, I mean, if you have strong magnetic field, then you have dimensional reduction of the system. So your uh, to lowest Landau level particles travel only along the magnetic field lines and not uh, just this transverse drift is not um, encouraged energetically. In rotation, you don't have like that. It's why spherous particles tend to, due to centrifugal, for, centrifugal force, they tend to, to you know, to move uh, along the uh, along the radius of rotation. So it's not a rotation is not magnetic field. Also, some approximations at slow rotations, you can really treat uh, one by another. That's all. But it's an important point because many people say, okay, it's not in, nothing interesting. You just take magnetic field apply and you get uh, something like that. No, it's not the case. You don't have this. And then you say, okay, now let's come to more interesting stuff. Let's now consider interacting theory. So simplest interacting theory, which is ugly, okay, but it's most beautiful in some sense that it describes physics uh, very well, phenomenology from one side of view. And it's ugly from the point of view, it's not normalizable. So infrared cutoff, uh, ultraviolet cutoff serves as physical variable. Uh, it's a number linear model, which is well studied. So it says like, so it's what was the number linear model. It's very simple thing. Just uh, we have some Lagrangian, uh, which we write right now in space spacetime because we have rotation. She has, you have some fermion, you have some mass here. For fermion, it's, uh, we don't have consider any, we don't consider any background fields. So just uh, it's uh, normal that it feels nothing. So it's non-charged fermion. And we have four point interaction, which uh, enjoys, uh, which, which respects chiral symmetry, continuous chiral symmetry. That's all. And here there is dimensional full constant, which makes theory non-normalizable. And we consider action, which contains also a reminder about the fact that we, have, we are working for space time. So, okay, so we have here uh, rotation embedded here. We have here uh, the coupling constant, which says how strongly interact ferments interacting via gluon exchange. And we have also here temperature, which is not seen here, but we will add it just to study the theory and thermodynamic ensemble. And then uh, using that spectrum of fermions, which are discussed before, we can uh, just consider, okay, what we will have. So if you consider, this is this just typical phase diagram, which appeared, I think, in our work, but there are many of them, I will flash also others. That's how generally what we have for fermions. So if we increase rotation, so this is omega times R. So omega is rotational frequency, R is radius of our cylinder, which we rotate and uh, with some particular value. Uh, yeah, and this is critical temperature of the confining phase transition in unit sum of some lambda of some scale. Okay, uh, so we see that if we increase rotation, so if we make system rotating faster, then the critical temperature becomes lower. So it means that uh, its rotation basically destroys chiral condensate. 
because here, oh, sorry, what I did not say here, sorry, that's what I did not say probably that the system, uh, yeah, that's that's what I, okay, that's what I removed because I tried to reduce number of transparencies. Um, this uh, system exhibits chiral symmetry breaking. So we get chiral condensate, psi bar psi, just coming due to this particular term. I shouldn't remove this transparency, sorry. So uh, it comes due to uh, appearance of the, this, uh, the, you get psi bar psi, just due to the fact that uh, this coupling G becomes too strong. And uh, at zero temperature, there is critical coupling, which can be tuned uh, from phenomenology. So you take masses of mesons or of, uh, some, some hydrons, and then you say, okay, then this coupling should be like that in terms of the cutoff. And then you recover other properties of QCD. So, and here, if one looks to say omega equal to zero, we'll have at some uh, temperatures, uh, we have uh, dynamically broken phase with non-zero chiral condensate and high temperature, this chiral condensate will be uh, just uh, zero. So temperature, temperature fluctuations, they restore symmetry. And that's an agreement with, with what, what happens at QCD. And then it appears that the same thing, uh, the same effect uh, is also induced by rotation. So if you apply rotation, then fixing the temperature, you move this plane and we see that at some point, at some particular rotation system will become, uh, will lose chiral condensate and will go to unbroken phase. Unbroken phase physically can be associated with the foregone plasma phase and broken phase with hadronic phase. Okay, that's 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 we see that from here that goes down. Then the question is okay, we, you got it just by in formulas, but then explain us physics because it's right now just hand waving and formulas. The physics here comes back to uh, Einstein de Gas effect, or better to say to the Barnett effect, which is opposite to Einstein de Gas. So Einstein de Gas says the following: so if you have some ferromagnet, it's just been disordered phase, and then we just apply magnetic field, then magnetic field will elongate the uh, all, uh, all spin, internal spins along the magnetic field. And then due to spin orbit coupling, because we, okay, we have, we have spins and uh, we have associated magnetic moment with those spins and spins are also carry some mechanical uh, rotation. So they have some uh, orbital, uh, sorry, they have some spin, spin angular momentum. And since the system uh, conserves total angular momentum, then elongation of these uh, spins along the magnetic field by external magnetic force will lead system, uh, will put system in rotation just due to the fact that, okay, angular momentum is conserved. So that's known as the gas effect. And there is a Barnett effect, which is opposite to that. That's when we just take the system in disorder and start to rotate it. Then due to that spin orbit coupling, the uh, those spins will try to elongate along the uh, line of, uh, along the axis of rotation. So just these two opposite effects, basically, uh, yeah. You see that rotation coupled to magnetism, and magnetism couples to rotation, and that we can associate magnetization of the system with the uh, rotation. That's actually how by people in condensed matter uh, discuss, correctly discuss that magnetism is similar to rotation. That's because of this Barnett formula. I can describe the rotation in terms of some magnetic field or gamma, some kind of susceptibility. And uh, actually this experiment, let me just flash transparency because it's, it's actually quite interesting thing that people do it with the water, actually with the protons in the water. So you take water, you take uh, protons which are disordered, which put, can have some spin up, spin down, and then you rotate the system with some velocity, with some angular momentum, like angular, so angular frequency, like 10, approximately 10 kilohertz. And you get that, yes, uh, the system gets magnetization. So water can be magnetized due to Barnett effect. And this can be measurable uh, from, from real experiment in some uh, coils and uh, yeah, so it's, it can be done. It's actually a paper which published this has published has been published four years ago. So this Barnett effect, this is a nuclear Barnett effect, but we will discuss quark Barnett effect. Does the following: so if you have quark, this quark gluon condensate, in normal situation uh, due to exp okay, just let me flash it like this. So it's kind of this this uh, spin zero condensate, it's spin zero object where you have quark up and quark down together bound into some. You can imagine it like some. A condensate agent basically so you have this condensate in the vacuum and then when you rotate then uh, the uh, due to this rotation the uh, spin orbit coupling will try to turn all quarks uh, into one direction so when uh, th this poor uh, say condensate part will come to will feel this rotation then the quark in the just flip the sign and uh, we will get spin one condensate. So spin one condensate will form, but spin zero condensate, which is quark one condensate will be destroyed. And that's how you- uh, uh, So you, you mean that here we have a kind of a pseudo gap phase and, uh, and the rotation 
uh, provide the ordering in the pseudo gap rate, something like this? Yeah. So, yeah, that can be formatted like that because spin one condensate is still a condensate, right? So in principle, one can be, but actually people discuss with this. Yes, they discuss. The problem here that there is also temperature here because if you just try to rotate with the vacuum uh, without uh, say real vacuum, so temperature is zero, then you'll get no effect at all. So this kind of this kind of um, relation actually works in the sense that there is some particle which gets uh, kind of thermally excited, then gets rotated, and then it come, goes down to condensate back, and then the, the, the kind of the vacuum part, and that's kind of there is kind of interaction between vacuum part, the condensate part, and the part which is. Um, really rotating so it's not so that simple so it's not the mm, so this explanation is uh, correct but one should say that we are talking right now about thermal excitation so thermal excitations are connected to vacuum excitations and we talk about the kind of what's the effect of uh, thermal uh, excitations and also rotation on the condensate but yes, uh, spin one condensate is assumed to be formed. There are works people see that the spin one spin one condensate can be formed and uh, you get some yeah, some, if you can call it pseudo gap phase, because, uh, okay, <laughs> still in QCD, we have gap. Uh, we, we have, in, strictly speaking, in QCD, we always have gap because we have, first of all, nothing really vanishes at phase transition. Second one, phase transition doesn't exist, it's crossover. So it's, um, yeah, there are some signatures of pseudo gap, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. in some very very distant sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because it's, it's too complicated. That sense the theory is not so clean, not mathematically clean. Yeah, but but effect of that, yes, uh, this burnt effect, which is we, we can really see signatures of burnt effect, how is thermally excited part kills, uh, thermally excited and rotated part kills uh, the real condensate. It can be seen from mass gap equations. So, yeah, and then all pictures like that, approximately. I'm just flash here transparency again. So this is just from another paper. Then it's here temperature, here is rotation frequency. And then you see that phase goes down. I mean, just this currently restored phase here, currently broken phase, and we see that phase transition goes down. So basically rotation inhibits the uh, chiral condensate. There are many questions to these diagrams because actually here there is no mention about rotation. And also we can see that when uh, this point, uh, say approximately corresponds to 0 0.3 fermi, it's too small. So you cannot rotate too big. You know, you have also some limit due to not to exceed speed of light at the boundary, but still this, uh, what all models get. You take any model, you get this result approximately plus minus, you know, some model dependent uh, things, but it's understood. So, okay. It's, it's good works. Now come to bad thing. <laughs> now come to the confinement. Again, this is chiral condensate. Oh, I flashed it. This chiral condensate, which goes down, we explain it right now. So we see that what happens with that with rotation. Now consider confinement. To study confinement, we don't need fermions. So we will forget about them for a moment. And then here, there are many, many, uh, okay, not many, but some papers. Uh, with uh, the confinement, uh, confinement, the confinement transition, it's difficult, more difficult to work because we don't have so, so many beautiful models here. So we have like polyco model two plus one for monopole confinement, but this is two plus one. Uh, then we have some, some other mechanisms like, okay, like uh, this stringy mechanism, central string mechanism or central vortex mechanism or this um, uh, dual superconductor picture, but still we don't have such beautiful model which can be so tightly related to phenology. That's why uh, to my, uh, the one of the first works which appear, and I think this was first work, um, first numerical work which appeared on the subject was by Moscow group by Braguda, Kotov, Kuznedelev and Rayenko. Here they published in Jet Letters uh, three years ago the paper, and then there was a holographic approach of uh, of of the of the Chinese group. Then also I made some some model analysis. Then Japanese appeared also with their paper. Again, Braguda strike again. So there are some works here. The problem here that all <laughs> um, some of them are contradictory. Actually, theoretical work here is they they are contradicting what is done numerically. And contradiction is so rough, so we don't understand what's going on because people apply some procedure. Okay, you can ask about some holography settings, but they used also some good holography uh, setting, which is used everywhere, basically. So in that sense, uh, it should work. Yeah, model analysis. Okay, I, I will tell you a bit later. So let me say what's going on. So that's what uh, was proposed from the from the uh, models. Let me just look to this part of the diagram because I don't have time to discuss everything. So this again, this is temperature. That's uh, omega in some units, in some holographic units. So they don't put any units here, but it's just okay. There are some units here. That's temperature. And this is omega is a rotational frequency of global rotation. Again, it's everything rotating globally. And we see exactly the same line. Okay, so just temperature, omega and omega, increasing omega decreases T. So temperature goes down with rotation. Okay, we understood that. 
perfect. Then we come to people who works in so-called hadron resonance gas. Again, I removed the transparency to discuss the details, but the idea that you describe basically your uh, excited model, uh, your, your gluon plasma like a bunch of hadrons. So you have some hadrons, you have spectra from particle data group, and you discuss them according to say to their masses. And uh, you see how, I mean, then you can describe this, this characterize also by this hydron temperature. So you can say, okay, you have some, basically some, uh, so your temperature excites everything which is in the particle data group. And that's used to construct the, um, the partition function or statistical integral. And then you try to find what is influence of rotation, which couples to the spin of particles. To, uh, to the phase diagram of the system. And here we don't need to, to consider two mu, mu is chemical potential. Let's consider only to this part. So here is a uh, temperature and here is omega, which is strangely for uh, presentation reason goes backwards. So this it's increasing here. So from this model, which is you can really take, uh, see in the, in the basically in the books, you see that, oh yeah, here we see also that temperature goes down with uh, increasing of rotation. So again, it's very nicely agrees with holographic gr group. Nice. It's a completely different approach. Then uh, you can discuss general arguments, uh, what should happen. And let me just flash here very briefly. Again, I remind you what is the um, tensor, or oh, sorry, what is metric tensor here? Metric tensor has here some components here, and here there is genot not component. That will be important. And when you come to this, okay, sorry, just one second. And then uh, you can immediately remember the so-called tolmer Tolmer-Renfes law, which says that if you have the system in curved space time, then in generally, and if the system is in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, and the same that it's uh, static, so it's uh, not static, I mean, it's it's um, uh, steady state, so it's not, it's uh, closed, or it's, uh, one should also say that there are the magnetic, so, sorry, this, the background doesn't depend on time, so it's uh, uh, system which is time independent, but it can rotate, of course, so it can be steady and in thermal equilibrium. Then the temperature at which the system thermalize is not uniform, and it depends on some reference uh, temperature and on the, um, um, the zero zero component of um, metric tensor in this particular way. It's called thermal uh, tolmer first effect. It has been uh, found a uh, long time ago. And uh, yes, and this integral coordinates here, we see that uh, this G zero not not is just given by distance, unity minus distance from the axis. So it's rho squared times omega. And here we, we again see that uh, violate, we shouldn't violate the causality bound because this system thing then become imaginary and system will become imaginary. So it's impossible. So we have to keep uh, this bound steady. But what's, what says this, what, what this law says is that uh, in fact, uh, we, we see that temperature, kinetic temperature of the system in equilibrium should increase as we move to the boundaries. That's all. So just uh, system is cold inside and hot outside. That should, that's, what, that's what should be. And uh, then, okay, I will skip the derivation, how it's done. If you naively apply it to a quark gluon plasma, you'll get something like that. So you, to, but basically you can apply it to any plasmas, but here we're talking about quark gluon plasma. You will see something like this. So we will see that uh, at, so the, at low temperatures, you will get confining phase. So system rotates, but ever, everywhere is confinement. And once you hit the point, uh, when you increase the temperature to the point where your boundary, effect temperature of the boundary increases over the, the confining temperature, then system starts to get hot outside and still cold inside, you will get this mixed phase. So cold uh, part inside and hot part out outside. And once you rotate it faster, then it becomes in the confinement. So that's kind of general idea how one can Okay, we will take faster. Sorry, it's the, here. Here, this picture is presented for some uh, the some um, particular fixed temperature of particular fixed um, uh, omega. But here, what we increase, we increase temperature. So the important point here is that you'll get in between. You'll get some phase which will be mixed. And uh, I hope that it's clear. So it's it just kinetic. It's just kinetic idea. And uh, I got it doing some. Uh, Many calculations in the Polyakov loop, or so let's say, the effective Polyakov model with um, um, with the um, monopoles, uh, and I get this just directly, and then I found it okay, but it can be done just not in complex electrodynamics, which I mentioned, but just doing this simple exercise with the the uh, Tomer and Fest idea. That's all. So the point is that here, so your rotation leads to the confinement, but the confinement appears at the boundaries, not in the center. And, and and what is going on with the uh, uh, Dirac operator spectrum uh, in this case? Uh, ah, here, because, uh, okay, be, be, okay. Because it, it, the Dirac operator spectrum, uh, localiz Anderson localization of Dirac operator spectrum is some indication of of uh, the confinement. 
Okay, that's a good question. People say when they don't know what to answer, because in fact, uh, here I consider what here is considered is purely kinetic uh, thing. It's a purely kinetic approach. And here you see the most important point that uh, the system becomes inhomogeneous. Uh, if you would like to talk about Anders localization, for example, fermionic modes, right? Yes. Uh, that, that's what I, that's that's a little bit different story because then. Mm, okay. Sorry? Okay, I don't hear. Yeah, so uh, so with Anderson localization, I know people study that, but I don't know that. I think nobody uh, really uh, tried to do that in a rotating system. That's that's I don't know. That goes a little bit off of the direction. To Sasha, I don't know what to reply here. So, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but you see, there is one point which I would like to say that there is one thing which is important, which may be related to your question, because um, uh, Peter, like Ivan Horvat, Horvat uh, who studied Anderson localization, mm -hmm. uh, he found that actually Anderson localization appears at temperatures higher than TC, as far as yeah. I remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I it will be talking about higher than TC, but in different respects. That's why maybe you have some feeling, kind of intuitive understanding what's going on. What mm -hmm. I say here, it's very primitive. It's basically textbooks, even beyond Landau. So just it's something which is very, it just, it just a, a kinetic effect, that's all. Also one can do that correctly in interacting theory with those uh, mon monopole instantons, but it's very, very, very trivial here. It just, we can apply it to any guess, so. Okay, but we'll come back to to the to the higher temperature effects. So we have this phase, and then we come and when we come back, we will see that okay, just naive. If you just take this what I have written before and just try to put this phase diagram, we will see that okay, you have here hadron uh, phase at low temperatures and low chemical potentials. Here it's at fixed uh, rotating uh, frequency, and uh, quarkian plasma will appear here, of course, at high temperature and high. Okay, say. Organ plasma, I would say it's uh, the uh, restored phase. But I don't talk here about the, the uh, phases which correspond to um, uh, color superconductivity, possible color superconductivity. But what's interesting that here you'll get also some mixed in homogeneous phase, which corresponds from conf to confinement and deconfinement. And it's an interesting point that uh, rotation leads to some also counterintuitive effect, to which I will not be talking about right now. It corresponds to, as again, as I discussed before, it corresponds to the mixed phase where confinement is inside. So normally, if you have something like, for example, a cup of coffee, you know, it gets cold uh, from outside and uh, hotter inside. Uh, but here, a system works vice versa. So once we hit system, or we kind of, yeah, we hit system, it just becomes hot outside, but still keeps cold inside. So it's kind of counterintuitive because, okay, in quadrant plasma, everything cold, gets cold outside. But of course, understandable because here we consider system equilibrium. We don't consider just uh, um, communication with external system. But I would like to stress that this phase is quite interesting here. It just comes from kinematical reasons, nothing more. And then we come again. So we come holography here, uh, then hadron resonance gas. Both of them say the temperature decreases with omega. And then we come to this work, which says, okay, if you take some non-trivial omega, then still you see that I mean, system eats a little bit, so the confining phase spreads down. So it means that the effective temperature also goes down. Then we come to results of Moscow group, which was published, okay, some years ago. And then we see that the situation actually should be different. So critical temperature must increase with a rotation. So here, omega squared, here is C2, which is a certain coefficient, positive coefficient. And we see that critical temperature actually must go up. So for people, it was a shock because, okay, here are established models, you know, Okay, all of them are known to give predictions in other in other directions, uh, in other circumstances, circumstances, but here it gives, they fail. So the question is either there is a problem with numerical method or there is a problem with all those th theory, uh, theoretical approaches. But numerical method seems to be very well established, very good. So it's just, uh, it was originally comes uh, from, uh, okay, 10 years ago, it was suggested. So you can take lattice, which is actually squared, but you can kind of squeeze it a little bit. So make it rotate, introducing some effective metric. And in this metric, you, since you work on the lattice, you work on Euclidean phase, uh, Euclidean formalism. If you consider system Euclidean space time, making actually the, um, uh, considering in imaginary time formalism, then you have to change, of course, uh, temperature to thermal time. So T equal to I tau. And then if you write system in a rotating frame, due to the fact that you have coupling between rotation and spatial coordinates and uh, time, 
so you have a diagonal uh, components of um, of the metric tensor, you will easily get uh, here um, action uh, which contains uh, the um, complex uh, which becomes complex. So it contains uh, uh, imaginary unity. So I, and those actions can be simulated on lattice. People, then people say, okay, we know what to do. We have we have seen the same thing with the chemical potentials with bearing chemical potentials. So we consider a system with in, in uh, imaginary chemical in, in imaginary rotation. Okay, this imaginary rotation. So we take we take rotation, which is imaginary. So omega is equal to i omega i. So and then we'll, we'll make later the analytical continuation. That was wise idea. So and then I skip all derivations. They can be found in references. But what's what's interesting that uh, if you get, uh, for example, here imaginary rotation. So that's what obtained on the lattice. So here is uh, dependence on temperature on imaginary uh, angular frequency. And then you do omega, sorry, here is misprint. So you go do from imaginary rotation come to real rotation and here omega squared changes sign. And that's the way how you get a result. So it means that uh, your rotating system, uh, in the rotating system, critical temperature numerically goes up with uh, rotation. So it contradicts everything which, which has been already uh, published in terms of the, uh, I mean, theory. So, and there are also other works which appeared later after those works appear. They also say, okay, temperature should go down, not up. So it's a big puzzle. <laughs> we don't know why it's going on, but it's just a miracle fact contradicts to what we know from all possible theory approaches. And, and, what, will, uh, uh, and uh, what will happen if you consider two different uh, rotation axes in, in Euclidean space, you can uh, introduce two different uh, angular velocities. Uh, okay, that's a little more complicated. You see this raffinated. In principle, one can try, of course, to do that, but you know, it will be kind of rotation. Okay, first of all, this rotation will be more complicated because if you rotate not along the principal axis, then this will be, not, will be no thermal equilibrium, right? Because mm -hmm. rotation will, uh, you know, it's like with, with asteroids, you know, they rotate chaotically and there will be no, will be chaotic dynamic, but there will be no thermal equilibrium. That will be, I don't know, there will be a problem. So I'm not sure that it's possible at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then let me come to some striking part because I'm really um, coming here. So the, there is one point which can resolve this puzzle. It's the recent work which has been sent to Arca like two weeks ago or ten days ago. It's uh, our common work. Uh, so it's uh, about negative moment of inertia and rotational stability of gluon plasma. So actually, we found that uh, gluon plasma actually is unstable. So you cannot apply a rigid rotation at all. So let me flash briefly transparencies what we have here. So it just from again Landau books, you see that uh, Landau Lich's book, you see that okay, what's the definition of angular momentum? Let's define it. Uh, angular momentum is given just by uh, this variation and is thermal variation of um, uh, of the moment. Okay, of um, the free energy in corrotating frame with respect to uh, omega, omega is angular uh, velocity. And from there, you can get the definition of isothermal moment of inertia, which is just uh, I divided by omega. Okay, fine. Okay, sorry, G, uh, angular momentum divided by omega. Uh, that gives you angular uh, isothermal moment of inertia. And in corrotating frame, I skip here higher order corrections, just let's consider this only one first, first order. Then you'll get that, uh, in fact, your uh, free energy will depend on uh, just will be free energy without rotation minus some quadratic part where I, uh, the moment of inertia comes with minus sign. And it's normal because we know that if you start, if you stay in the quadratic frame, then you'll feel some centrifugal forces outside. And this is just representative of this force. So we have some negative force which unbounded. And then we know that it's unbounded. We will be, we will be pushed out, away from the axis as far as possible. Okay, I mean, for slow rotations, of course. And then, uh, so it, it's, it's quite nice to characterize this system if, since you work in cylinder with some kind of dimensional moment of inertia, just to put all dimensions, dimensional full factor together. And uh, we will characterize it in terms of K2. And this K2 is nothing but, okay, we can just use it to express again the moment of inertia in the cylinder with uh, so, some kind of ge geometric factor, basically, which may depend on boundary conditions and also on geometry of your system. So it's given by free energy in the rotating frame times R squared. And this, this will be number from yeah, some, some number of the order of unity, basically. And you can, it's quite convenient to characterize rotation. Okay, and then we come to the lattice and, okay, not the lattice, yes, we come to lattice and we can say, okay, now we can calculate it. The question is how to do that. The best way to do this calculation is again to come to imaginary time. So we, since we work in imaginary time formalism, we have to consider imaginary rotation. 
And uh, we just take uh, this formula, which comes in rotating Minkowski spacetime, and say, okay, right, right now omega becomes i omega. So, so the velocity at the boundary of the cylinder becomes a imaginary velocity. But since we consider it squared, it will just change here sign. So that will be our free energy in Euclidean spacetime uh, with uh, the same coefficient, exactly the same as in Minkowski, but coming with imaginary velocity, which we control. We, we know how to do this on the lattice. And then we know how to calculate free energy. It actually comes from conformal anomaly. We know how to do that. It's done a long time ago. So uh, due to the uh, thermodynamic relation, we know that uh, this uh, trace, or it's called trace, conformal, sometimes while anomaly, scale anomaly. So we call it trace anomaly. From this trace anomaly, we know the trace of energy momentum tensor is given uh, is related to free energy density in this particular way, just thermodynamics. Here we do, of course, thermodynamics on curved background, but it will be just the same. So then we can restore free energy from by integration. So measuring conformal anomaly, and we can know how to do this on lattice. We can restore uh, the uh, these uh, uh, the free energy of the system. So this this is basic idea, and then this is just recent work which I mentioned before. It just I don't know, I don't this one oh no this one it just uh, this one is just in, in March. We still in March. Uh, so it's like that. So we measure free energy here as the function of temperature. And here, different colors they um, illustrate different uh, angular, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, different imaginary angular velocities of the system. And then we see immediately that there is some point here. So there is some behavior. It's typical, actually. It's very typical for 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 for, for the free energy. Um, but we see here there is a point where those lines cross each other. A crossing means that uh, the system, uh, this free energy, starts not to depend on velocity at all. So, okay, since it doesn't depend on velocity, it means that, uh, okay, it doesn't depend on velocity. It means that this coefficient kappa is, uh, this K2 is vanishing, yeah? And then if you look to this coefficient carefully, we get that this K2 is negative at some particular temperature below, uh, uh, below some Ts, some particular temperature, and positive above this temperature. So actually it should be positive for real uh, interacting, interacting systems, normal systems. It's usually positive. But here we get it negative for, 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 for gluon plasma, and it's getting negative below Ts, which we call uh, this particular temperature, which is approximately higher than 50% higher than critical temperature of the confined phase transition. We call it super vertical temperature because uh, here the moment of inertia vanishes. It's like a di very distant relation with the superconductivity. So in certain temperature, resistivity vanishes. So here we have uh, angular momentum, and angular momentum vanishes. Or, or moment of inertia also vanishes here. So, and it becomes negative below. And the result is very good from, if you like species, if you look to this, you see, okay, there is nice scaling here. We, we took different lattices and actually we took different volumes. There are also different boundary conditions and they all match each other. So this K2 is nice. Moreover, what is strange is that um, if you try to fit it, you will see that there, is, there are two lines here, almost invisible. One line is um, kind of, uh, you see almost invisible line. This one is a um, uh, solid line, uh, red kind of red solid line. And another one is dotted line, oh, dashed line. One of them is a fit, another one is continuum extrapolation. They almost coincide with each other. And the fit comes like this, just numerical fit without any theory. It's just rational fit. which say that you have here K, K, K2 at infinity, which is approximately two, which agrees with some estimations for free rotating gas, which we should actually have. And C is equal approximately to one within error bars. So we have this nice fit, which explains everything. It, it says that actually at the critical transition, the uh, this case dimensionless moment of inertia diverges and negatively diverges. Okay, and then you say, what's my negative moment of inertia? It's like negative gas, uh, negative mass. It's like Casimir energy, something strange. And what is that? Uh, it's uh, in reality, we do have negative masses, but only in open systems with some active components. Like we have some mechanical system with motors, which are activated by touch. So they, you touch a little bit and system kicks you back. And so you get energy from touch from, from applying effort or with some electronic systems, which you have some enhancers. Uh, uh, so, but they need external input. Here a system is closed. I mean, in sense it closed, it just, uh, nothing comes in, nothing comes out. So there is no pump. So it's static equilibrium. And then we come and we found actually ex examples that do exist in the black hole physics. So uh, there is instability. So if you have negative moment of inertia, it means that we have an instability, instability in the system. It's like, uh, okay, like just flash here transparency. So uh, the, the the thermodynamic instability includes uh, it's just 
it requires uh, this, that uh, this um, uh, inequality works, so it imposes this inequality. And uh, for rotating system, this inequality can be projected to uh, so-called um, um, condition that uh, this inverse manifold metric, which is defined in thermodynamic manifold, where we have it's four dimensional. In this case, it has temperature and components of moment of of, of omega of the um, uh, angular all components of angular um, um, velocity, so it's, it's a vector, uh, should zero. So we have four, four component space. And so this, this four component uh, space, uh, we can identify metric, which depends on free energy. So it's this effective metric. And so this, uh, uh, the all eigenvalues of this, of this metric must be positively defined. So it means that the uh, specific heat must be bigger than zero. And we know that in black holes, we have specific heat negative. In some instability, and also uh, the uh, tensor of moment of inertia, all all, comp all principal uh, moment of inertia must also be uh, bigger than zero, and that's do don't hold in our case. Doesn't hold in our case. So we have a thermodynamic instability at uh, the region which is between critical temperature and uh, this super vertical temperature. So it means that the rotation of plasma as a solid, which is applied to all, as we know, theoretical works, is impossible. So what people studied before theoretically, it has no sense uh, because such way plasma cannot be organized. So it can be interested, interesting from academic reasons, but uh, because normally people say, okay, you just a little bit rotate, like in, when people calculate carol vertical effect, you just consider very slow rotation and don't care about what happens on the boundaries and don't care what happens with your state because actually state should be close to what it had before because rotation is small, this kind of ideas of Kuba approximation. So they don't work here. So once you start to rotate, plasma becomes intrinsically inhomogeneous from very beginning. So stable rotation is impossible for uh, uniform plasma up to temperature, uh, super vertical temperature. And that's kind of main statement of this first part of the talk. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we have we have here the, the problem. Uh, and uh, when consider the instability in the spinning black hole, uh, what uh, what's the result of this instability? Uh, where it does, the, it does decay? Uh, as far as I understand, there is a radiation goes out. Uh, here as well, there should be here radiation. So you just okay. You prepare a system in the no, 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 no. I, I think it's it's it should be a different state. Uh, it's not uh, usually, for instance, the instability of black hole uh, produce your so-called boson star. Uh, when we consider the chemical potential, there are also some instabilities. And instead of uh, charged black hole, you have a, a so-called boson star without yeah. without horizon. So, 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 uh, so, my question is: Do this uh, process correspond to disappearance of horizon? Ah, okay, but okay, this, this what that's what I said. When you when you have instability, you have radiation, right? And then you have change of state. Black hole becomes this star, right? That's what you say. Mm, radiation, no? uh, yeah, radiation is quantum process, so it's a kind a kind of classical instability in the, in, in this situation. I, th I thought that here, that's my understanding was that here, if you start to rotate the system, it will try to reorganize itself. And uh, all organization usually should happen through instability or through 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 some radiation. So a system should uh, somehow mm -hmm. change it. That, that's my understanding, basically. I but I, of course, of course, I I don't know, because, you know, here we consider something static, which cannot be treated in terms of dynamical process. That's okay. Static, I mean, by static, I mean the it's steady state. You cannot, uh, in this approach, you cannot yeah. consider any time, mm -hmm. uh, real time approximation. But I would say that normally, if you have some uh, some instability, all instability means the system organizes itself. And then indeed, there is some kind of quantum, yeah, maybe, maybe quantum process, you know. Uh, it's really accompanied by some radiation. So why I say this, because if you prepare a state in state, for example, suppose that quark plasma at some particular point gets prepared by this collision in this state where everything rotates uniformly, suppose. Then there will be some processes inside and some uh, modes will take out of momentum, just angular momentum will take out, out of plasma. And finally, plasma will get some other shape and which is stable. So there will be a reshaping of the system, but this always comes with some emitting of some particles. It cannot be done with, uh, say, without doing anything. So this could be kind of smoking gun of this uh, of, of, of this finding. That's what I. Mm -hmm. that I okay. Black holes, of course, can be different because it's it's just uh, it's just kind of very similar, uh, but of course not identical because after all, the rotating uh, rotating plasma is not a black hole. Also, there are some similarities with the UNRWA radiation as well, with those soft photons and so on. But I don't want to dwell into this direction. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's okay. And then, since I have very short time, <laughs> uh, so this is one of these things. And then, yeah, an origin of instability. Let me say why it's ca coming here. It's uh, because you can ask uh, what's going on here, and I can say that here is uh, coming due to the fact that we have magnetic gluon condensate. That's something which has been neglected, and it has been measured a long time ago. You know, it's like 25 years ago people measured that and did not me measure after all. So it has been really impressed because I tried to find uh, you know some literature and I could not find it. Also, people lost attention. Okay, interesting this. So the point is that if you just take consider uh, just take formulas and say, okay, now I would like to calculate the moment of inertia in my, my system, you'll get basically two contributions. One contribution comes from the uh, basically Kuba formula. So basically it's how uh, angular momentum fills other angular momentum of the system. So it will be just correlator of this type. And then there'll be another another part, which will be one point uh, part, which comes uh, from uh, average of uh, basically of magnetic gluon condensate in this respect. So there'll be some components here of F mu squared. And uh, uh, yeah. And this part is uh, just appears here, just from formulas, you can calculate it. And the fluctuation part, this part, which corresponds to fluctuations of different, uh, of, of angular momentum, it's per basically perturbative. Maybe it will contain some perturbative part, but it that's something which perturbative system has. And there is not perturbative part, which corresponds to this magnetic condensate. And this non perturbative part is known to be a negative quantity in SU3 glue dynamics. Yeah, we have data only for SU3 glue dynamics up to t equal to c. So in fact, one can imagine that you have this part, which is negative, uh, plus a usual part, which surely be, should be positive. And they together, as up to some particular temperatures, they should uh, give negative co contribution to uh, angular moment of inertia. And that's an idea. So uh, that's why we think that this, the, the key point why we have this instability is magnetic gluon condensate, not only magnetic gluon condensate, but actually thermal contribution to magnetic gluon condensate. And that's how, why we give this non-trivial uh, non result of gluon instability. Okay, so that's that's the main kind of one part of the talk. And another thing, so that's that's we found, it's kind of unusual and we don't know what, I mean, we know what to do further. So we'll go, just we'll do some other, uh, other kind of try to push it further to understand it, uh, the system. But I would like also to say that people, uh, it was quite popular to consider the CFT, CFT ideas and others to consider hydrodynamics in the system. And in hydro, you can also have some instabilities just of developing of high hydrodynamics, uh, just because you can consider it like coagulant plasma, is this hydrodynamic system, which after some short time thermalized and just expands and uh, this expansion can be to try to uh, consider it like a non kind of kind of complicated uh, non trivial hydro uh, in hydro regime and there are also instabilities there this instability has nothing to do with hydrodynamics it's just a uh, different non perturbative instability which arises uh, basically without considering any uh, any Navier-Stokes equations or nothing like that. I mean, no, they are relativistic parts, nothing. It just uh, appears from basically from the vacuum or hot vacuum. And if you consider, for instance, the matrix model uh, for QCD, which, uh, I mean, Gorbachev like mod and introduce the, the uh, angular velocity, uh, can you reproduce uh, such? Uh... Okay, okay. You, you look you look exactly to what we think about. So at the moment, we don't know. We discuss it. We discuss this, you mean this uh, Pisarsky type of things, uh, yeah, Skokov mm -hmm. and others, right? Uh, this uh, matrix models for polycov loops. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we are thinking about this. We are thinking about this, if you can do that, if you can. Let me right now flash another part, which is actually should be faster because uh, this kind of was a general introduction, but I probably I spoke too much about this. But I would like to say that core plasma is not trivial. So it's what I would not expect from the very beginning that we have negative chem, negative um, uh, angular velocity. So, oh, so, so not angular, negative, sorry, just a negative um, moment of inertia because that's something which you expect for having to, to have it say in some Casimir systems, I don't know, or some open systems. Or here we have uh, this closed, uh, stable, uh, unstable instability just appears. And again, it's closed a little bit to what, what people see in black holes. And then let me come to imagine rotation from different point of view. I just very briefly flash also a few transparencies. First of all, <laughs> since we consider imaginary rotation, again, we work in Euclidean space-time here. Why we do interest in Euclidean space-time? Because we're interested in the um, in the um, um, this imaginary time formalism to describe system in thermal equilibrium. So we have thermal equilibrium. And uh, the question is, okay, now let's consider a system in thermal equilibrium. What does it mean if you rotate it? 
here there is one interesting, quite non-trivial thing, which is otherwise it's small, but on the other hand, it's quite non-trivial, is the fact that if you start to rotate non-trivial, if you start to rotate an imaginary system, then you come uh, to um, uh, non-trivial boundary conditions. So if this is uh, imaginary time, uh, then you have to associate uh, points, uh, different points uh, at different uh, parts of the system. So this, you have to introduce so-called row twisted boundary conditions, where uh, lines are, uh, say, O prime, A prime line, does not match to itself uh, at uh, other side of the, um, of, of, of the system. So you have some twist. You have some twisting of condition of, of just a geometrical space uh, about the rotational axis. And that's something people didn't consider before in the literature. So at least long time ago, I don't know, I, I haven't seen that. So it's modification of the thermal boundary conditions. And uh, okay, that's that's what's going on. And then the question is whether we kind of rotate this system in Euclidean space time, can we, uh, can we actually gain something interesting? Can we get some new insight? So, and the idea here is that in fact, uh, so if you have no rotation, then you have just periodic boundary conditions, for example, for bosons and antiperiodic for, 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 for uh, fermions. And if you rotate it, then you have to kind of to rotate the space at some particular angle, which, uh, okay, one can say it's just some statistic, I would call it statistical angle or uh, some other angle. So there is some angle of rotation. So it just corresponds to product of um, omega, so imaginary omega times beta, and beta is one over temperature. So you control this uh, angle, uh, this angle of rotation by product of inverse temperature times uh, your uh, physical omega of uh, imaginary frequency. Okay, so, and this is non-trivial boundary condition which hasn't been considered before. And the question is uh, how it affects thermodynamics. Okay, so I, at least I haven't seen it in the literature before in this kind of relations. So it reminds many things because people discuss, for example, twisted boundary conditions when they rotate fields. That's fine, but here is different. We rotate space. There are also shifted boundary conditions and people consider, uh, for example, uh, kind of shifted time or shifted space. So just linear translations, but here is rotation. So the question is whether this is somehow affects uh, the system, the modern the system and what it corresponds to. So, and right now we come kind of to branching point because we have right now two different types of rotation. One of them is rotation is which encoded in boundary conditions. Another rotation is kind of this non-inertial rotation when we modify uh, basically field theory on the lattice by applying, by considering it in curved space time. So there are two of them. Before I discuss this one, and right now I'm coming to this one. And one can show that both of them actually agree with each other if you consider slow rotations. So just, but then right now I will not restrict myself to slow rotations. And I will see that uh, there will be here some differences because for example, here, if you consider two pi rotation, you will come again back to the starting point. So that's why it means that uh, this type of imaginary rotation, this is kind of inertial, imaginary rotation doesn't correspond to an inertial completely. So there will be some differences, strong rotations. Okay, and then uh, the question, another one. So for example, if you say, I would like to consider right now confining the confining transition, then the first question is, what is your order parameter? And normally it's Polyakov loop. So you just have to have some line, say A prime A and just put line and then one line consider the multiplication of your uh, matrices or say in, in integral, integral over gauge field. Um, uh, order at integral of gauge field. Now, since you, if you do that in this with twisted boundary conditions, then you will get the quantity which is not gauge invariant. So that's why you need to consider polycool loops which are also modified. Mm -hmm. So which connect, yeah, which should be modified. So and then uh, and the yeah, boundary conditions are written in this way. So this is just uh, you you kind of have to shape point at the same radius, the same z and the same tau. Okay, sorry, at the same row and the same z uh, just by rotation. So when you just come from tau equal to zero to tau equal to b, you get here just third by angle phi, uh, by angle chi, which is omega i times b. Okay, so this just, again, I repeat myself. So just saying that also also, also the non-local uh, order parameters must be modified here just because you have no chance to do anything else. Then Tolmer and first effect should be modified as well because here I flash very briefly. So you have again Tolmer and first effect corresponds to red blue shift of thermal length of radiating systems. So for real rotation, you have uh, here Tolmer and first, which says that equilibrium temperature should uh, uh, increase when you go out of axis of rotation. For this type of imaginary rotation, one can derive the Tolmer and first gets modified. So effectively, your 
okay instead of omega minus omega squared you get plus omega squared but in this fancy manner which takes into account periodicity of rotation so in this imaginary time formalism with imaginary rotation polymer n has become different but it's kind of understandable of course trivially and then uh, I will just very briefly flash here transparencies. One can just try to associate this kinetic variable. So saying that what happens in Minkowski that I flashed you with this mixed phase and what happens in Euclidean, just because Tomer and Fest effect uh, kind of inverse sign here, uh, you will get some kind of mirror images, uh, I would say, or better to say negative images of the faces here, of this mixed phase. It should become kind of instead of uh, in hot cold or cold sorry cold hot uh, you should you should get hot cold that's all just because the sign changes that's all so that's that's the kind of changes which we are which we expect uh, in this case and then what we did we just uh, also predicted let me just I briefly flash because I would like to come to the Dickin function finally just at the very end so um so we can kind of say okay this is our prediction for real at rotation what should we get uh, for phase diagram so we have here temperature in terms of the confining phase temperature in uh, non rotating phase time space time here is uh, omega in terms of radius of the system uh, this angular uh, frequency and here we expect that we should have some confinement phase mixed phase and also the confinement phase in imaginary time formalism in large phase, large space, we would naively expect that we have here some mixed phase about some uh, temperature, some specific mixed temperature, and then we'll have the confinement phase. So we 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 will will not have kind of the confinement phase, but okay, if it takes some radius, it's large, but it's reasonably large. Uh, we can get two phases: first of them confinement phase, and then mixed phase. We would not get actually the confinement phase, totally the confinement phase in that case. Okay, that's kind of naive expectation. And then again, we can do the lattice. On lattice, of course, we cannot uh, rotate by any angle. So we can rotate only by pi to the two because lattice has only C4 symmetry. So we cannot actually rotate at any angle. We, we, we take cubic lattice, very well established cubic lattice. So we rotate it by this angle pi over two. And then, uh, okay, we can identify many different uh, types of uh, polycov loop. One of them is just straight loop with have no rotation. Then we have this pi over two rotation. We can have this kind of shifted loop with some kind of jumper here in the middle. So it, it's, it corresponds to a steady kind of rotation, but it's what we can do in lattice. And then we can do also kind of four type loop, which, you know, which means from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, you know, it can connect four points, but it wins four times and it's still closed. So it's this loop can be considered like a laboratory frame loop, which does not feel rotation at all and uh, kinematically. And this one feels rotation. So it connects pi prime with pi. So it just kind of like this loop, which, which all of them are gauge invariant. Okay. And then we do calculations. And what we see that uh, if you consider the uh, corrotating frame and consider polycoop open that, you see that once you increase temperature, here is temperature. These are our configurations. We see that once you increase them, you see that some the confining, I would say, in terms of loop variables, phase appear in the middle. So it looks like we see we do see really kind of in homogeneous phase kinematically because we identify this variable kinematically. Yeah, and uh, we see that in our language which we used before. So this imaginary rotation, so appearance of this mixed phase using this Tomer and first law should correspond to appearance of mixed phase in QCD. So when we rotate, so we should have this inverse hadronization effect when, when you map a real frequency to imaginary frequency and vice versa. So we do really, this kinematically, we see that we see a phase which is cold inside and hot outside if you map from Euclidean to Minkowski. Yeah, so that's that's kind of in principle that we see. Yeah, and if you do the same trick, uh, let me just, <clears throat> without there are too many details I will not show, but if you just do measurement laboratory frame, we see nothing. So laboratory frame doesn't feel a rotation at all. So we see only in rotating frame, which we, when we see, we see just appearance of new phase because it was kind of new phase because people normally when discussed homogeneous phases, they consider superfluous, for example. Here we see kind of usual glue dynamics and we principally we should expect it, this uh, phase uh, with two different components. Then you can ask, okay, you get it, uh, these boundary conditions, can you do something more with this? For example, we know that we have instantons. Okay, in finite temperature, they're colorons. Huntington-Shepard colorons. So can you say 
produce some interesting in this particular uh, boundary conditions. Okay, it's, in principle, it's possible. So I skip here details, but the idea is just the same as in the case of Harrington Shepard. So you just take your system, you identify it with periodic boundary conditions. So consider a system periodic. Here, the boundary conditions will be road twisted. So we have a shift in uh, imaginary time plus uh, turn in the space. And then we can get solutions, which are described in terms of Harrington Shepard functions. The only interesting thing here, these are just the flash transparencies here. The only interesting thing here is that you get this type of solutions. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So here is here is uh, the uh, omega no rotation. Here is rotation is uh, when rotation is say half rotation. So you know this is typical two pi divided by beta. It's typical uh, quantity which you can write uh, typical scale for rota for imagine rotation which you have in the system. Then you have third, for example, part of it you will have three here different uh, instantons. So basically, you know, instantons kind of get fractionalized. So you get here instanton with the the number uh, topological uh, number one, so topological charge one. Okay, non units. If you rotate it uh, with frequency, which is one half of major frequency, you get uh, two connected uh, points. Uh, if you have uh, frequency one, three, you have three connected uh, no lumps, and each lump has fractional charge one third, uh, here one third, one fourth, one fifth, and so on. And uh, so basically, if you consider high rotation, then you get from one instant on, you get this nice solution, which actually can be expressed in, in terms of elliptic uh, functions. Um, really like this, and if you take this, uh, say two different instantons, you get this serious guy, which is actually a numerical solution for <laughs> for the for the instanton scalar function. So you get uh, you really get instantons, and they're quite interesting. The uh, point which is striking here, let me see here, yeah, is that if you plot here uh, this uh, instanton for temperature, which is equal not one fifth of the main, but two fifths, you'll get exactly the same solution. Or if you get say three fifths, you get exactly the same solution. So it looks like if you just look carefully to the to the to the um, uh, actually to this um, um, to those solutions, you will see actually that in fact solution doesn't depend on numerator of your frequency, mm -hmm. because here we consider frequencies which are uh, re I mean which are by definition okay, just kind of first approach they are they are rational so they are they are they are um, a ratio of two. Uh, Two, two, two real valued, uh, okay, sorry, um, integer valued quantities, uh, which are non reducible. Yeah. So, for example, and it turns out that the instant solution depends not on numerator, but only on denominator. In that sense, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths are just the same solutions. Okay, that's interesting. And when you say that your quantity depends only on uh, ration, ration feels difference between rational and irrational numbers, and it feels uh, it depends only on numerator, on, on doesn't depend on numerator and depends only on denominator, then it's a signature of a fractal structure. It's there are many fractals which are defined exactly by in, Mandel, in Mandelbrot sense, exactly by this relation. So let's move then further and uh, then try to just do the following thing. Just let's consider rotations which are labeled by this uh, kind of this relation. So omega uh, imaginary frequency is labeled in terms of times beta which then it gets it becomes uh, the number which doesn't depend on the uh, okay it's just dimensional number which can be formulated as statistical number let me write it in this guy because it comes from zero to one those to two pi uh, okay so it's just let's just characterize in terms of ratio of two integer numbers reducible numbers okay and then one can calculate the um, for the system one can calculate the uh, equation of state. Since the system is free, it's easy. So one can calculate energy density, pressure, entropy density in terms of uh, the same system, the same quantities for non-rotating system. It's conformal, so it's, we have zero mass. Yeah, and you know them in terms of beta. And then you'll get that actually you'll get this kind of formula where Ft is so-called Tomaya function. And beta uh, comes, so temperature comes as mm -hmm. a function beta times omega i, so it's angular rotation. Yeah, by the way, I consider right now infinitely large system because for for image rotation, we don't have any problems with the uh, causality. We don't have causality at all here. Mm -hmm. And to my function is also known as, as popcorn function. It's a very simple function. It's like directly function. So it's, uh, it's equal to one over uh, denominator if the number is rational and it's equal to zero when number is irrational. And one can see that, uh, yes, and on the rotation, let me say that 
all thermodynamic characteristics thermodynamic depends only on this two Meyer function, and it depends on uh, ima imaginary uh, rotation. So, okay. So when, for example, beta is or omega is equal to zero, then this one is equal to one. So then we restore what we have. But if it is non-zero, then we give this kind of structure. So here, for example, I show you the energy uh, density one over fourth as a function of uh, okay, just it's just multiplication of some particular scale. So here is here is the function of this statistical angle, which is nothing but uh, omega times uh, beta. And then I take small part of it and just multiply it again, multiply it again. Here we go from factor Z, from factor one to factor one over a thousand, and we see that pictures are just copying each other. So it's known for a long time ago, just a uh, just a fractal, just a fractal function. Okay, so we see that the uh, thermodynamic becomes in some sense fractal. <laughs> When we just uh, consider this, yeah, this function, let me show you how it behaves. So here we just uh, consider frequency in units of um, two pi divided by beta, and here we consider energy density uh, and power of one fourth, and we see that this function basically re replicates itself. So this imaginary rotation leads to fractalization of dynamics. Okay, at least it, we don't know what exactly corresponded to. Uh, I suggested to some coherent states, uh, but this is a big question. One should give another seminar for that uh, to, to discuss it. And then let me come back. Uh, then, okay, well, then one can show. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, and then uh, then I would like to say that, uh, of course, it can be seen, but it can be, of course, shown uh, for sure that you see that if you look to this function, one can see that this function is an analytic. So, it's just, it's not differential at any point. That's why it's impossible to come to st stay, for example, to make this um, analytical continuation from imaginary rotation to real rotation. It's just impossible because uh, function, normally when we do analytical continuation, we assume that at both sides of, uh, of the system, we have analytics, we have analytical uh, functions. Uh, at imaginary rotation part, the system is non-analytical. So that's why we cannot make analytical continuation from uh, imaginary rotation to real rotation if system is big. That's important. Here I consider infinite volume limit. So it's impossible. See, and here I just, I show that it's just by example that you can get whatever you want when you do analytical continuation. And then the, now I come to the Dickin function. So uh, this last transparency. So right now, okay, but let's understand how uh, still still we know the system is small. Then still for small system, you see, you can see that behavior is not like not wide wide like this, uh, but behavior the dependence on omega is smooth because I have seen you I have shown you before lattice data. It did not show any any signature of this kind of uh, of the problems. So we, should, we expect that the system should be smooth. That's why it's understandable that uh, probably for large systems in Euclidean space-time, in imaginary time formalism, with those reduced matter of conditions, we have fractal dynamics and non-analyticity. But once we come to uh, smaller systems, then somehow the system becomes um, smooth, and then we come back to, oh, sorry, it's moved, moved. And then we can, yeah, it's strange. Ah, this is the same number. Yeah, and then we should come back in principle uh, to the uh, to the fractal system. So we should have some kind of uh, changes changes from uh, smooth behavior to fractal behavior. And in principle, of course, I mean, uh, if you consider a three dimensional system, uh, it's difficult to do because it's uh, okay. As I said in the beginning of the talk, thermodynamics is complicated. But uh, for the uh, for thermodynamics, I mean solutions of thermodynamics in in, in in the cylinder are complicated. But for the ring, it's possible. So what we do, we just take uh, the particle in the ring. It's, it's worked with Victor Ambrus from Romania. So we take a particle in the ring and assume that system is rotating. So we have some thermodynamic thermal particle rotated with some frequency omega, and one can calculate the thermal part of free energy here, and it's now coming to the Dedekind functions. Can be expressed in the Dedekind functions, just at functions of one over r and omega. So omega here is a real rotation. And then uh, I would like to do the following thing. I would like just to come to, um, to imaginary rotation. So make system rotate in imaginary and then increase radius of the ring. And then I would like to see how the system becomes from, uh, comes from the um, imaginary rotating. I mean, kind of from smooth system where analytical continuation possible to the frac fractional system. And here L is just a radius of the ring in terms of thermal length. And we can see that if L is one, it's perfect, slow rotation, everything is smooth. Okay, so small ring, everything is smooth, and then everything is smooth. And once we increase size of the ring bigger, bigger, and bigger, then we see that system becomes kind of self-replicating and becoming kind of um, non-analytic or 
fractal. So because you see that, for example, looking here to alt equal to infinity, you see that we have here behavior like this one. It's typical for to my function. So we have here, you know, some kind of towers which are self-embedded. That's actually a signature of the of the um, of the uh, fractal. So we see that it's just basically property of this function. And I have here basically final video. So in this video, what we see, this is just pressure as a function of this uh, angle, uh, of this statistical angle. When we rotate in here, we increase the angle, increase the size of the ring. So we increase size of the ring. And this is this is size of the ring, it increases. So it becomes bigger. And here is the pressure on the system, normalized pressure. And we see that pressure gets in. Enhanced, it becomes bigger, 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 and you see it becomes fractalized. So in the sense that it gets features of fractal just basically from uh, uh, from the analytical solution. So yeah, and there is this work I would like to throw this nice work. I don't know why it's not published, where the people were just uh, Sergey Nechayev and uh, Pol Polovnikov, another person, just yeah, just discussed and they found this interesting limit. So that it can function a particular limit becomes to my function. And that's related actually to interestingly that's related to the uh, to this interesting um, image rotation and to this no go theorem for analytical continuation. So we can just we will, this we will just going to publish a paper soon with Victor Ambrose. So now coming back to the end of the story. So sorry, I took a little more time. So conclusions, which are actually not conclusions, but kind of um, approximate conclusions. So first of them is just for pure fermionic model. We are, I think, we know everything. So we know that rotation inhibits chiral condensate and reduces critical uh, chiral transition temperature through the mechanism, which is, can be considered like a quark Barnett mechanism, quark Barnett effect. That's known. Uh, then, okay, uh, then if we consider, oh, sorry, uh, here I talk about the confinement. So this is chiral temperature. As for when we consider the confinement, the system becomes more complicated. So because we have analytical uh, continuation, analytical um, solutions, they predict that analytical models, they predict that system should just follow exactly the same what happens with fermions. And in reality or in lattice, we see that everything is different. So temperature actually gets enhanced, critical temperature gets enhanced by a rotation. So that's something which we don't expect. So resolution, which is possible, uh, and I think that it's just a thermal melting of magnetic gluon condensates, which did not exist in any of those models. That's I think that it's the reason why we have there. And uh, so in our work, recent work with um, Moscow group, we just found that, uh, yes, we have this uh, additional temperature, which is, can be related, as Sasha said, it could be related to Anderson localization temperature. It could well be, we don't know. Uh, it, we have this super vertical temperature where, where the critical, uh, okay, where uh, moment of inertia vanishes and becomes negative below that. That's something which is totally unexpected for us. So we have this uh, rigid rotation and instability of rigid rotation, similar to black holes. Again, I repeat, it doesn't, we don't know how it exactly goes this process. But uh, to me, uh, you said that, uh, yeah, you said that it will be for black holes, it will be some strange stars or some other stars. Here in this case, uh, uh, we see that the system will just becomes inhomogeneous. So it's, I think that rotation cannot be uniform. It must become in homogeneous rotation. And this is thermodynamic instability and not hydrodynamic one. So there is a big difference. Yeah, so we have some signatures which are not actually yet explored that we have a new phase in QCD due to rotation, which is in homogeneous phase. And uh, then we see also fractalization of hydrodynamic, oh, sorry, thermodynamics due to rotated twisted boundary conditions, which are non-trivial. And we see that, okay, I have shown you this non-go theorem, which you say that analytical continuation from Euclidean to Minkowski is impossible at large volumes. At small volumes, it's okay, but at large volumes, it's impossible. Okay, sorry, I'm, I finished, so it's probably too long, but <laughs> I finished uh, my talk. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot um, for the beautiful talk. Mm. Sorry, I, I, try, I tried my best. I hope that people mm. did, did not sleep too much. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, l l let me make two comments. Uh, uh, the first one concerns uh, the uh, last example when we consider particle uh, particle on the uh, circle. And the previous example, actually, the previous picture as well. So uh, this is a kind uh, when we consider the image, the kind of fractality uh, for the imaginary uh, <coughs> angular velocity. 
It's a kind of uh, example of uh, analogous of the quantum Hall effect. So in that case, you have the same uh, situation. You have fractality as well. You have uh, very similar stuff. And this is just uh, the um, example <laughs> when we have matching between magnetic field and uh, the uh, <coughs> imaginary angular velocity. And uh, when we consider particle uh, on the circle, uh, once again, you have a kind of uh, theta term uh, in this case. Imagine, imaginary uh, rotation is related to theta term, and theta term, once again, is uh, similar to, uh, to the uh, whole conductivity. Uh, it's just uh, the general phenomena of fractality when you have two, two coupling constant, uh, one is real and the second is topological, and then consider renormalization, you in quite general situation uh, find yourself with this picture with Tama function. Uh -huh. And actually, we are writing some big paper on with Nietzsche, Polovnikov, and uh, other, one more guy on this stuff. Uh, for gen general picture behind this phenomenon. Okay. And, uh, okay. Can, I, can I ask you because it's for me it's very interesting because for us it's uh, something new which we nev never okay we saw we know that there are there are of course fractality and there are many interesting uh, features mm -hmm. of fractality but what's to me it's interesting that uh, um, how can can this kind of imagine rotation angle in terms of I mean for the uh, imaginary time formalism have it ever has have it been discussed before. Because for us it appears naturally like example of the rotating system, and we. Uh, okay, so uh, so it's it's related to the second uh, my, my second comment. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, when we consider supersymmetric young milk series, uh, there is nice uh, picture due to Nikrasov when you consider the angle uh, uh, in Euclidean space, uh, he introduced uh, two angular. Uh, Rotations because it's possible to introduce two of them in uh, Euclidean four dimensional space and investigates the, the dependence on uh, the partition function, instant, instant on partition function on two uh, angular velocities. Also, it's possible to introduce one of them, but also two. But um, there are some funny phenomena which uh, I am still confusing with. So, when, when you try to uh, to evaluate the uh, the mean uh, angular momentum in the system in imaginary, uh, you just just consider the imaginary angular momentum. You you find a kind of instability in the class of partition function. So uh, I could send you the reference on this point, but it looks like that in in that case uh, there is instability with respect to imaginary rotation uh, in in the instanton ensemble mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in our case we don't see instability but okay so this system is not interacting that's why we don't uh, we, we don't have it uh, so um, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if we consider interaction, I know that we have strange phenomena. For example, we have some non-trivial non um, dependence on um, uh, temperature. So we have some kind of temperature, for example, induces condensates in interacting systems. Mm -hmm. That's what I see already. Uh, yeah, but we don't uh, see instability, and uh, it would be interesting to me if you can if you could send me uh, references because we don't we don't we don't saw that kind of this kind of uh, examples before in the literature, and we tried to associate it with some physical systems. Uh -huh. so it, it can be considered in supersymmetric setting, but uh, the situation is very similar. You consider just in, instant on ensemble and and t t and look at the back reaction on the imaginary rotation. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. It's it's not the real QCD, but a supersymmetric case. But yeah, I see. I but in that case, it's possible to get the exact answer, and it provides a kind of uh, quite unusual instability. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, yeah, but here I would like to start that instability that we have observed in QCD, it's um, uh, kind of not this one, it's a different mm -hmm. one. So, yeah, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's real, that's real instability and it's not not, not been done in this approach. And uh, here we see here is also important point that all these fractional points, the uh, fractional behavior, they appear only due to um, when the volume is large. 
you follow me small, you see, as I have seen it in the video, it just disappears. So it's mm -hmm. a smooth behavior mm -hmm. and there is uh, no problem. And physical situations, they correspond to small volume, of course, because we don't want to violate this uh, uh, superluminal constraint. That's that's. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Yeah, it will to me it's also interesting if you can discuss at some point about quantum, or you can if you can send me some reference about quantum hall where people discuss similar things because I know it, okay, we know that indeed it is quantized. There are mm -hmm. some similarities in that respect because basically, yeah, we have this uh this kind of uh yes, uh, uh, th those kind of relations so for sure. Mm -hmm. But if somebody discussed this kind of pictures, it would be interesting. I I, I did not see that. It, yeah, yeah, the, 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 there are several papers uh, with the similar pictures. Just uh, just an just an renormalization of um conduct whole conductivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Be because it's it's actually the same. So, so you, you investigate the whole conductivity as a function of magnetic field. Here mm -hmm. you investigate mm -hmm. the dependence on the angular velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, you will consider theta term. So uh, in all cases, you have a kind of diffusion plus uh, plus uh, some topological term. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there should be some similarities because you know we would like to see where it corresponds to because here we can simulate it. We can see that. And by the way, I would like yes. to say one interesting point here. One interesting point about instabilities you see uh, we can simulate uh, systems for example uh, i discussed uh, uh, here for example those those simulations right so these simulations are simulated with uh, at a twisted angle so we have this non-trivial twisted angle and this interacting mm -hmm. system this is real uh, not supersymmetric but real i mean kind of usual i would say not <laughs> usual usual young mill theory and there is no instability here at all so it's too perfectly stable in this mm -hmm. case so it probably it's feature of supersymmetry maybe or because here we have instantons which are lively you know <laughs> they appear in the vacuum mm -hmm. so that's uh, so in that sense the system is stable but it's so yeah it should lead to some interesting on trivial physics i hope mm -hmm. okay. very interesting thank you that's actually why i give seminar i would like to learn something new <laughs> 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 thank you very much Okay, and actually, I must say that I must run right now because, uh, yes, because I must run. <laughs> Sorry, just yes, so, thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. Th th thank you very much. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for giving this opportunity to give a talk. Thank you.